This is ChestertonRadio.com. Chapter one of our four-part series on the life of St. Paul the Apostle. We were thought to be great teachers in those days, and perhaps we were. The word teacher can be translated to mean rabbi. I was a rabbi. My name was Gamaliel. I was middle-aged when the Nazarene walked among men. I attended his trial, witnessed his crucifixion, and rejected everything he had to teach us. I lived in an age of great miracles, and these miracles, too, I rejected. And yet, as I look back, I sometimes think that, in a sense, I was partly responsible for one of the most amazing miracles of my day. I shall go back to an evening when I sat in the courtyard of my home in Jerusalem, staring at a young man who was intent on introducing himself to me. He had journeyed a great distance to present himself to me. As you know, I am... Um... I'm a Jew. Well? By that I meant I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. And you say it with all the arrogance of a Pharisee. Are you one? I am a Pharisee. No one will ever challenge that. Well, sit down, my son. Tell me your name. So? Of what tribe? Benjamin? The house of Benjamin, yes. So you're a warrior. From a tribe of warriors. I would hesitate to place a sharp sword in your hand. <laughs> I carry a dagger, Rabbi, but I come to you as a student. You wish to become a rabbi? It is my father's choice and my wish. He said, go to the Rabbi Gamaliel, who lives in Jerusalem, and learn all there is to know about the traditions of our people. And so I am here. A most forthright young man who honors his father. There was something else he told me. Oh? He said, never in Jewish history has such terrible danger threatened our traditions. Your father is right, my son. And so I want to learn all you can teach me about our laws and about our traditions so that I can usefully talk about them later on. And will you defend our culture? I think that is what my father had in mind. He seemed to think it may need defending. Where do you come from? Tarsus. In Cilicia? Yes. How much do you know about the law and the prophets? I know every word by heart. And our traditions? I wish to study them to understand their purpose and meaning. And so you shall, Paul. So... You must grow used to people calling you by the Greco-Roman interpretation of your name. To the Jew, you are Saul. To the non-Jew, you will be Paul. They uh, cannot pronounce your Jewish name properly. I've always known that, but never understood it. Well, now tell me what you think of Jerusalem. It's noisy and crowded. And so you must expect wickedness here. There is wickedness everywhere. You'll find many pagan women here. Rabbi, I'm a proud man, too proud to squander myself on worthless women. There are other kinds of women, too. And I am too dedicated to my studies and the future to think of attaching myself to a wife. I am not sure you will please God by rejecting the idea of marriage. I am dedicated to God, the God of Israel. <laughs> And so did I meet Paul. His knowledge of the law was astounding, his faculty for learning beyond belief. In the long months that followed, the fire that burned within his soul for Jewish culture burst into flame against the spread of Christianity. Why are they permitted among us, these so-called Christians? They even use the synagogues to preach against us. They defile the synagogues, defile our traditions. How can you sit there so calmly and say nothing? What are we going to do? I don't know, my son. I am an old man. It is for your generation to do whatever must be done. Even the Romans do nothing. And still, the Romans are wise enough not to interfere with Jewish law. Think about that, my son. Hear me before you take me away. Hear me! For the word of Christ continues to spread across the whole world, and the numbers of his disciples increase day by day, even here in Jerusalem. And large numbers of your priests 
have already turned to Jesus and have accepted the faith. Who is he? A faker. But a Christian. One of those you hate, my son. A betrayer of his own people. A Jew who now violates his own synagogues. I think his name is Stephen. It's time we made an example of one of them. Oh, they're taking him away. They took the man, Stephen, away and tried him on the steps of the synagogue for all to witness. And they condemned him according to Jewish law. And when the trial was over, they allowed him to speak. Let me say these things to you. What if you persecute me? Didn't you persecute the Son of Man? Haven't you always opposed the Holy Spirit? Didn't your fathers and their fathers before them put to death all the prophets who foretold the coming of Christ, whom you betrayed and murdered? You who pretend to maintain the law. Kill me if you've a mind to, but I say unto you, behold, behold, for I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Kill him! Kill this viper! You know the law? The law prescribes death. Put him to death! I put him to the death! <laughs> The execution of Stephen was carried out in strict conformity to the Hebrew law. The law stated that blasphemers like Stephen should be dragged by a crowd outside the city and there stoned to death. Paul and I joined the crowd that performed the execution. The crowd started to hurl stones at Stephen. I saw him fall to his knees, his face and body now red with his own blood, as he lifted his face toward heaven. Lord, do not lay sin against them. Lord, let me repent for them. They're calling him a martyr. Yes, I've heard that. The first Christian martyr, they say. I've heard that, too. What is it, Saul? Today we saw a man killed. And I was one who called out for his death. Many of us did. He forgave us for killing him. That bothers you? No, I was just... Yes, it does bother me. These people, these Christians, are fanatics. They believe in their faith. It's dangerous. Yes, most of us realize that, my son. And each day they win more converts. You realize that, too? We all know they are trying to undermine the synagogue... And we know a great many Jews are turning to Christianity. And still we do nothing about it. We did something today. Killing one man is not enough. What? Killing of one Christian preacher is not going to stop the spread of this new faith. No, I suppose not. He was arrested, tried and found guilty, and he was executed. And the Romans did not interfere. Nor did they interfere when we put the Nazarene to death. Then we have a free hand. We're free to deal with these Christian converts. If we can kill one without the Romans interfering, we can kill them all. If we justly execute one for blasphemy, we can execute thousands. The law provides us with that right. Thousands? They've got to be stopped. Rabbi, you either agree or disagree. I... I agree, of course. If we let them go on this way, they'll destroy us. They'll destroy the entire foundation of Hebrew law. You see that, Rabbi? You make it very clear, my son. And do you see what's happening all around us? Jewish converts to Christianity leaving Jerusalem, going to other places, and spreading their new faith. Rabbi, they've got to be stopped. How would you stop them? By force. By massacre? If they resisted arrest, it might come to that. You would put them all in jail or kill them? I would be rid of them in any fashion that would serve. Does the idea frighten you, Rabbi? To execute one man is one thing. But to expose thousands of fellow human beings to massacre... There's no difference between killing one man or killing 10,000. There is, but I won't debate it. 
At least I was always right about you. You have warrior blood. Now I think I know my mission in life. I believe my father knew it when he sent me here. He knew our law had to be defended. Rabbi, I appeal to you. You must help me. Help you? Speak to the elders. Make them understand our danger. Tell them to give me soldiers and authority. I must have that authority. You mean this, don't you? I mean every word. I... I'll talk to the elders. But talk with conviction. Tell them I will clean up Jerusalem first, then I will hunt down Christians wherever I can find them, even if I cross the world. I'll not leave a single Christian alive. Is it hatred for the Christian, you feel? Hatred, yes. What else could it be? It is not just an opportunity you see to possess power. Do you believe that? No. No, my son, I believe you're sincere. And I know you're right. I will talk to the elders. I will go before the council. I come before this council to speak of Saul, of the tribe of Benjamin. Of Saul, whose father was inspired to send him to us. Of Saul, a most brilliant student of our laws, a Pharisee by birth, and a citizen of Rome. But above all this, I speak of Saul, the warrior, with a warrior's blood that cries out for the right to defend our Hebrew traditions against our sworn enemies. I say to you, give Saul authority. Give him soldiers. Commission him to seek out those who plot against us. Give him the right to put to death those who resist his authority. Saul, have you talked to them? Tomorrow you go before the council. I believe you will be approved. The council gave Saul its approval. The next day, a soldier called on my pupil. I am Reuben. I am of your people of the house of Benjamin. You command a company of soldiers. We are yours to command. You know what our assignment is. To defend the law most vigorously. I have a long list of names. Converts to Christianity. All of these will be arrested or killed while resisting arrest. You understand? I would be a dull fellow not to understand. And so began Saul's campaign against the followers of Christ. And a reign of terror spread all across the holy city. The nights and the days were filled with the screams of women and children being dragged from their homes. Many of them butchered in the streets. Hundreds fled to the hills. But Saul and his men rode after them and hunted them down, putting them to the sword. And no one interfered, because the law of the land prescribed death for those who opposed the teachings of the synagogue. And this was the first persecution of the Christians after Christ was put to death. As Saul pitted himself against Christ in heaven, and I and others like me, applauded him. Why, never tasted better, Rabbi. Well done, Saul. Well done. Well done, indeed. Wine has the taste of blood in it. And so the job is finished, eh? In Jerusalem. My next target is... Uh, yes. Yes, I think it should be diaspora. They say it's seriously infected with Christianity. Rabbi, tell me something. Yes, my son? You did a fine job convincing the council to give me authority. But I once heard it said, you warned the council against taking extreme measures. My son, I am an old man. There was a moment when I thought we might use prudence and tolerance. But I was wrong. 
And you know I promoted your authority. There can be no more weak moments, Rabbi. I shall move against the city of Diaspora. And so the terror crossed the desert and struck at the Christians in the city of Diaspora. And within two months, Saul returned victoriously to Jerusalem. And once more I went before the council at his most urgent bidding. The council will listen. You may proceed, Rabbi. I come to speak of Saul, who in fact and deed is the defender of our laws and traditions. It is now his wish to move against the Christians in the city of Damascus. Rabbi, this is a most grave request. I am not sure we wish to extend our plans outside of Palestine. There would be considerable risk in such measures. Then I beg leave for Saul himself to address you. Let him do so, Rabbi. May it please the council to be reminded that Judaism is not confined within the borders of Palestine. It extends across the world. These Christian vipers are spreading out across all lands, spreading their blasphemous preachings against our culture, threatening to convert more and more of our brother Jews to their alien faith. I beg you to give me authority to move against Damascus as a beginning. When I have cleansed Damascus, I will choose the next objective. There are hundreds, perhaps thousands of Christian converts in Damascus. Tell me to destroy them. Give me that authority. Saul had his way. He at once ordered his henchman, Reuben, to assemble the soldiers. And next morning, the cavalcade rode out into the desert. They covered 30 miles on the first day and made camp at sundown. You're silent, Reuben. Uh, it's the desert. Our... Adventure disturbs you? Has it ever? You know this to be a holy crusade. I know it to be that. You know something, Reuben? I curse every Christian on this earth. I curse them with my blood and my hatred. I curse the name of the Nazarene carpenter who started all this trouble against our synagogues. Did you ever see him? Several times. You heard him preach against God? He always claimed he was the son of God. And you listened? Thousands listened. Some believed, some didn't. How did he speak? Oh, with some authority. You know our people. Unless you speak with authority, they won't listen. Did you like anything he said? A few things. But I mostly laughed at what he said. What did you laugh at? He told people to drink of his blood and eat of his flesh. He'd have you believe that his blood could wash away the sins of the world. A fanatic. He could draw big crowds to him. What about these apostles? Have you known any of them? I've seen them all. At least the original twelve. There are many more now. Men like that are dangerous. We'll have to deal with them. We'll hunt them down. There's one called Peter. A roughneck? So I hear. I'd like to run into him. I wish I'd come to Jerusalem years ago. Well, we've only just started, eh? There's time... Time to catch up with all these vipers. They rested on the Sabbath and rode a full six days. 
Toward the end of the sixth day of riding, they came in sight of Damascus. Damascus in sight. I can smell Christian blood dripping from my sword already. What about you, Reuben? Leave me at least one Christian priest. It happened in the fraction of a second. A blinding flash that enveloped Saul and his company of soldiers, causing them to fall to the ground in terror. What's this? I can't see. Am I blind? Am I blind? Saul. Saul, why dost thou persecute me? (sighs) Paul was blind, yet he saw the figure of Jesus standing nearby. Paul was not conscious of the miracle. He was conscious only of Christ. And in that moment... His hatred of Jesus died, was no more. He stretched out his hand toward Jesus. Who art thou, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Lord. Lord. What wilt thou have me do? Arise and go into the city, and it will be told you what you must do. In this manner did Saul the Pharisee die, and Paul the Apostle was born. There was nothing left of the past, And there was everything of the future to be built. But Paul was blind. And in the company of soldiers who were sworn to the task of killing all believers in Christ. Listening to Chesterton Radio at ChestertonRadio.com. Chapter 2 of The Life of St. Paul the Apostle. My name is Judas. Not to be confused, I pray, with the one who betrayed our Lord. In my time, I was landlord of the best-known inn situated in the Jewish community of Damascus. It was there I met and knew Paul. He was blind when I first saw him, blinded and dazed, not a man to be feared. Yet at first I did fear him, knowing that he had set out from Jerusalem with a band of soldiers, to massacre the Christians who lived in Damascus. He was the archenemy of Christ. Yet, it was hard to realize this as he lay on a bed staring up at me with sightless eyes. Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. Of whom do you speak? Isn't Jesus the one you most hate and persecute? Lord Jesus, have mercy on my soul. Who is Jesus? This one you speak of. He is the Son of God who came to save the world. Strange words from a man who had cursed the very name of Christ. 
Afterwards, those who had led him by the hand to my inn told me what had happened. On the very last day of the journey across the desert, from Jerusalem to Damascus, Paul had been blinded by a vision of Christ. And Christ had spoken to him with love, with a love that had destroyed all of Paul's hatred. When Paul had been in my inn for three days, a Christian convert named Ananias came to me, asking to see Paul, and I left them together. Paul, I am blind. I cannot see who you are. Ananias is my name. I am one of those you came here to kill. Are you also the one he promised would come to see me? I must be, for I had a vision of Christ, and he told me to come to this place. He spoke of you as his chosen instrument, saying that you would carry his name among nations and that you will suffer much for his name. I will glorify his name, and my joy will be to suffer. Then, in Jesus, whom we both love, I lay hands on you, that your sight be restored and that you be filled with the Holy Spirit. And Paul was healed and could see. Afterwards he was baptized and went out into the synagogues to glorify the name of Christ. And when the Jews saw this, they called him a traitor and plotted against his life. But the danger did not trouble him, for he knew that in Jesus there is no death. My friend Ananias, I've come to say goodbye. Goodbye? All this is new to me. Too new. I haven't yet found myself. Nor have I completely understood what has happened to me. So I'm going away. Into the desert? And its solitude? You smile about it. But didn't the prophets of old also go there to commune with God? And to be alone with him. In these days, Paul disappeared into the desert and was lost to his friends and his enemies. Lord Jesus, I feel thy presence in the wind, and I feel thy forgiveness of my hatred for thee that is now turned to love. And I am overwhelmed that thou hast chosen me for one of thy apostles. And when a few years had passed, Paul came back to Damascus, but was forced to flee. And Christ directed him to go back to Jerusalem, where one of the apostles, Barnabas, took him into his house. I wish Peter were here. He would trust you and he would welcome you. You do not trust me? Oh, I do, yes. I had word from your friend Ananias. But the others, they are not sure of you. I'll be the last to blame them. Give them time. After all, only a few years ago you had sworn to kill us all. And you still spell trouble. I know. I was born to create havoc. For a time, the Jews have not bothered us too much. We've been allowed to preach so long as we haven't made ourselves too public. But now you have drawn attention to us again. And yet I feel our Lord wanted me to come here. But not to remain here. None of us expect to remain here long. After all, we are missionaries and have far-off destinations. You know that. I know. And there are many places in all directions. India, Africa, Macedonia, Europe, places yet unknown to us. And some of us may never come back. It will be a great adventure. <laughs> no doubt of that. Now Paul and Barnabas, 
journeyed northward to Antioch, taking with them another new apostle, Luke, who was still a young man and without much experience. And from Antioch they went by ship to the island of Cyprus, where Barnabas had been born. On Cyprus, Paul entered a Jewish synagogue and preached to the Jews who had gathered there. I come to you as a Jew, yet more of a Jew than most of you, for I was born a Pharisee, dedicated to the preservation of Hebrew law. Some of you know about me. You know I was the sworn enemy of Christ, that I put to death many of his followers and threw many more into prison. But now I come to you in his name. And they listened, Jews, pagans, and Gentiles. And is there one among you who is not familiar with the law? No. Nor is there one among you who has forgotten how the prophets of our people foretold the coming of the Messiah. Yet when these prophecies came true, who among you believed? Who among you believed the Christ had come? Instead, you persecuted him, and you rejected him, and he was put to death. But I come to tell you he died that you may be saved. Now let me tell you about the miracle of my own salvation and how Christ appeared to me. Many who listened were baptized. Even the Roman consul turned to Christ. When the apostles left Cyprus, Paul became leader. But when their ship put into Adelia on the mainland of Asia Minor, Paul and Barnabas pushed on into the mountain wilderness alone because Mark would go no further with them. Why? Why did he go back? He was homesick. I think he was afraid, too. He's young, without much experience. If he, if he left us because he was afraid, then he must battle his own fear. No one can do that for him. Listen. What? Horses. Brigands. Coming this way. We'd better hide. They went past. Brigands, wild animals, and impassable mountains. We'll have to expect all these... Roads are bad enough, but if brigands and Roman soldiers can cross the mountains, so can we. There must be villages along the way, towns, maybe a city or two. It can't all be wilderness. No, we'll find plenty of places where we can preach. Come, let's get as far as we can before nightfall. Danger always present. But there were towns and villages, and where there was a village, there was a synagogue. And Paul came across many who had known him before. And I speak also to you who are converted to Christ, and who are Christians baptized in his name. For you fled from Jerusalem and other places where I persecuted you. And you came here. And I say to you these words. Perhaps Christ made use of me even when I persecuted him. For through my hatred of him I caused you and many like you to seek refuge in faraway lands. And when you had come to these lands, you spread his name to all those you met. And the ones you met have, in turn, gone further afield and have also spread the name of Christ. We don't want you here. Who are you? And for whom do you speak? I am a Jew. And I speak for the Jews who abide by the laws of Moses and Abraham. We'll have nothing to do with your ravings about this Nazarene you call Christ. 
You come here to undermine the teachings of our fathers and their fathers before them. You're not wanted here. And there were those who joined in the cry against Paul and Barnabas, and who set upon the two apostles, beating them with sticks and throwing stones at them, until the apostles lay bruised and bleeding under the city walls. Even the wild dogs smell our blood. I, I doubt if I have one unbroken bone in my body. There'll be someone to bind our wounds. There are Christians here. In a while, they'll come to us. We are weak, weak and sorely afflicted. What was it our Lord said on the mount? When I am weaker, I am strong. Then we are strong, Brother Barnabas. Strong in the Lord. Rejoice, because we suffer in his name. Thank God for your courage, Paul. And they continued from place to place, and some who listened sided with them, and others sided against them. In days to come, they entered the little city of Lystra, where they preached in the streets and marketplace. And one day, while Paul spoke to those about him, a crippled beggar clawed his way toward the apostle. I know not whether I am a Jew or non-Jew. I am a beggar. Do you also speak to beggars? I'll speak to any who listen. I will listen, Master. And have you believed? Master, look at me. Look upon my misery, at my twisted body, at my shrunken limbs. Look upon something unwholesome that crawls and who has never known what it is to walk as other men walk. Look upon my filth, at my rags that cannot hide the dirt sores that cover this miserable body. And tell me whether it matters one way or another to Christ, whether something like me believes or does not believe. A man's body, whether it is beautiful or deformed, is returned to the dust from where it comes. I look upon you, and I see only what is inside you. I see the Holy Spirit shining within you. I do not see you crippled. You say you are, but I do not see it. Master, Master, I believe I have faith. I feel my heart bursting with it as I look at you and see truth in your face. Master, stretch forth your hand and I will be cured. I will be healed and made whole. Know that you are united by your faith in Christ. Arise and walk. For you are healed. Oh, Christ, my God, how can I glorify thy name? For I am healed, and I can walk like other men. Lord, look upon me, thy servant, as I glorify thy name. And the multitude fell back in amazement when Paul's miracle cured the crippled beggar. And many were afraid and fled from the scene, while some knelt and prayed. But the high priests of the synagogues were filled with rage when they saw the power of Jesus in Paul's miracle, and they plotted against him. Paul, mm -hmm. are you awake? Yes. Where have you been? 
to the marketplace, listening. What's being said? That we're sorcerers. Mm. You in particular. Everyone thinks this? Not everyone. But everyone is bewildered and many are afraid. So the high priests are playing on their fears. Well, we should have known. Because one sick man was healed, they're saying you're a master of magic. They say that too. That once we've gained the confidence of most people here, we'll use our magic powers to cast spells over them. They cannot understand that our miracle of healing was performed only in Christ and through him. And because of the beggar's faith. And we'll have precious little opportunity to convince them. Oh? The high priests are bribing people to testify against us. To swear that we practice sorcery. That much I found out. To testify against us. That means we're to be arrested. And put on trial. We could run. But there's nowhere to run to. Well, we could never get out of this city. Then we'll wait for them to come. No. Do you? No. But they'll be coming. At least we know the verdict of the trial even before it begins. We're already convicted. You know that's the law, Paul. I saw it applied once against Stephen. You can't forget him, can you? I suppose Stephen's death and its memory is a monument to my sins. I was one who cried out for his life. I helped to convict him. I stood by while he was put to death, stoned according to the law. Now with you, I stand where my victim once stood. Well, that's the way it should be. I only hope that when the time comes, I'll die just as bravely as he did, forgiving and blessing the ones who kill us. Is that what he did? He forgave them. As our Lord forgave those who put him on the cross. I was there. I heard Stephen's last words. Listen. They're coming for us. Well, we have time to pray. It may be our last chance. And so they were brought to trial. And the trial took place on the steps outside the synagogue for all to witness. When Stephen stood as we now stand, he was alone. No, not alone. For he stood with Christ. And we also stand with Christ. It looks as though you will be questioned first. You are a Jew? I am. And you preach against the Jews. I preach not against, but for Christ. You have entered the synagogues and have preached against the laws of Moses and Abraham. I have sought to enlighten our people and all other peoples, Jew and non-Jew alike. The law prescribes the sacrifice of oxen. You have rebuked us for making these sacrifices. Not by the blood of oxen shall your sins be washed away, but only by the blood of Christ. You know the penalty for this blasphemy. I do. And you? I do. The two apostles were convicted and sentenced to death. According to custom, they were dragged outside the city, just as St. Stephen had been. And there the crowd stoned them. When it was over, the crowd left the two bodies on the ground for the vultures or the packs of wild dogs or for any others who would dispose of the bodies. Alive. Paul, you're not dead. We are dead. The dead cannot feel pain. Spirit and torment. The dead cannot hear the cry of a wolf. It was a wolf 
and we are not dead. And when the night was come, help also came. Some of the Christians came out from the city, and among them were recent converts to Christ. And they carried Paul and Barnabas to the house of two women, whose names were Lois and Eunice, who were mother and daughter. And together with others, the two women cared for Paul and Barnabas, and brought them back to health, but in secret. And when the two apostles were well enough to travel, they called the converts together, as was their custom, and Paul spoke to them. Listen well to what I tell you. You are becoming many, but you are few. Do not go out in the marketplaces, nor in the synagogues to preach, but assemble in each other's houses to pray. Do not bring the anger of the Jews against you, for you are not many, and you will all be killed. For now you have one great purpose, to organize your various communities so that each community will become a cell, living its own Christian life and bound together in Christ. And in this way, the church will grow strong and will flourish when the time is ripe for it to flourish and when all may witness its growth. For a time, Barnabas and I will be far away from you. But we shall be one with you in Christ, and we shall pray for you. And someday we shall come back, and together we shall glorify the name of Christ. And now we take leave of you in his name. And the two apostles went on to the city of Derbe, preaching wherever they went, as they gradually made their way back toward Jerusalem, ending Paul's first missionary journey. And by now Paul had learned much, and his heart rejoiced that he was serving the Lord and would continue to serve. But his greatest work and his greatest trials were still in the future, and there were many who feared him and who worked against him. But as I look back, I think that if Peter was the rock on which the church was built, then Paul was the word that came from the mouth of Christ. This is Chesterton Radio, your home for podcasts of works by G.K. Chesterton, plus drama, comedy, mystery, science fiction, big bands, and much more. The soundtrack to your Chesterton day at ChestertonRadio.com. Chapter 3 on the life of St. Paul the Apostle. My name is Demarius. In my time, I lived in the days that followed the crucifixion of Christ, when the Christian faith was a new one, and to many, a strange one, and when its missionaries were pioneers. Many of them had known Christ personally, but there was one who had seen and spoken to him in a vision. He was Paul one of the two men who this night rested in a cave on a mountainside. The other was Silas, one of the new apostles. Now this was the start of Paul's second missionary journey, and this time he was not accompanied by Barnabas. Paul, are you asleep? No. Were you thinking of him? Who? Barnabas? No. I was thinking of what's ahead. But you miss him. I miss no man. Barnabas was a good companion, a good friend. We disagreed and we elected to go our separate ways. But I shall always love him. 
I even respect his loyalty to his cousin Mark. But you don't respect Mark. Oh, he's a nice enough young fellow. But not one I could depend on. I took him with me on my last journey, and he turned back. He could do it again. Still, he went with Barnabas. I wished them both luck. But I'm glad enough to have you as my companion this time. Paul, it was just that I can't help feeling that you might miss Barnabas. After all, you and he went through quite a lot together. It was our privilege to suffer. He did not suffer for me, but for Christ. And you can be sure you will share that same privilege with me. At least you know something of the country ahead and the people we'll meet. Enough to know that our lot will be a few floggings and no doubt prison, if not death. Enough to know that we who are Jews will suffer persecution from the Jews. Well, you better sleep. You sleep. I'll keep watch. Then wake me in a couple of hours and I'll relieve you. And keep your sword handy. I've heard the sound of wild animals in this neighborhood. Over mountains, across raging rivers, they made their way across Asia Minor. And where they found a village or town, they preached the gospel. Some listened. Many rejected them, driving them away. Until they came to Lystra, where Paul was known. And it was here that Timothy joined them. And now they went across the wilderness of Galatea. And in one place, Paul became sick with fever. Paul, how do you feel? I have felt worse. But you see how the seed of Christ is flourishing in this place. Today, even as I lay here in bed, they came to me. And I baptized more than two score. Tomorrow no one will disturb you. Oh, it would disturb me if no one came. In the days that followed, Paul recovered his strength. And it was then that Luke, who was also a physician, appeared in Galatea and came to see Paul. Sorry I took so long getting here, Paul. How are you? Better now, thanks. You might have been too late to even pray over me. In that case, Paul, I'd have joined the others and prayed for your soul. <laughs> and then begged Silas to let me take your place and go on with him. You talk like a real friend. I've found my strength, Paul, in Christ. God be with you, Luke. And where's my old friend Barnabas? Is he in this country? We parted when I came up here. I don't know where he is. Which way did he go? Into the wilderness. And where did you go? With you, if I may. I welcome you, Luke. And thank the Lord for giving me such a worthy companion. And they went on. Until they came to Troas. And standing at the water's edge... Paul looked out across the sea toward Macedonia. And so we go no further, eh? Macedonia lies across there. A good many places lay in that direction. I was just thinking, if you once set foot in Macedonia, you might go on to Rome. Rome. There are many roads that lead there, so I'm told. And I'm told it's a place filled with wickedness. There is wickedness closer to us than we'd find in Rome. Most of the cities across Macedonia and Greece. And you would have me go to them? It's something to think about. I, I, I don't know, Luke. I'm not sure Christ would want us to carry his name to places like that. Lord Jesus, let me know thy will. Let me be thy true instrument. Brother Silas, good morning. Good morning. 
Where are Luke and Timothy? They went swimming. Oh, then they must wait for the news. Silas, we're leaving for Macedonia. Last night they told me you were not sure. This morning I'm quite sure. Now I know we must go to Macedonia. And even beyond it. The distance by water from Troas to Philippi in Macedonia is not far. And Paul and the others sailed. And when they set foot there, they saw that many roads from all parts of the world met there. The marketplace was like many other marketplaces they had known. Travelers from far off Persia and India. Merchants from the Black Sea, from Baghdad, Jerusalem and Damascus. Fakirs, fortune tellers, snake charmers. And there were Jews, Greeks, Romans, pagans, Arabs, Nubians, and fair-skinned, blue-eyed men from countries far to the north. All the smells in the world must be here. And all the sins of the world, too. Well, we expected that. Behold! Behold, these men are servants of the Most High God. Look, who is she? A gypsy or a slave girl? Behold! Behold, these men are servants of the Most High God. Paul, she means us. Did you hear what she said? I know one thing. She's drawing attention to us. How would she know who we are? We've only just come here. Behold, for I tell you, these men are servants of the Most High God, and they proclaim to you a way of life. Who are you, girl? A slave girl, Master, possessed by a devil. Possessed? By the spirit of the python, Master, since my birth. She means she's a fortune teller. Are you one girl? I am many things to my masters. Yes, I have the power to divine the future. But the power is a curse on me, for it brings profit only to those I serve. And I remain a slave. You knew us for who we are? Oh, yes. You are disciples of the Christ. You know who Christ is, then? Nothing goes unknown in the marketplaces. But how did you know who we are? I defined it. By what power? By the power of the devil that possesses me. What do you think, Silas? She's telling the truth. I think so, too. And this devil guided her to us to tempt us. Is that true, girl? I do not know that. But I think it could be true. The devil is a wicked spirit. At least you know that. Yes, Master. I was told that even in Persia, where I was born. The spirit of the python, you said. Yes, a most evil one. Then be cleansed of this evil in the name of Jesus Christ. Know that you are cleansed? Yes. Then I will also baptize you. Blasphemous dog! And who are you? He is one of my masters. Take your hands off that wench. Stand aside. Stand aside? You dare tell me to stand aside? You, get out of this land. Get out, you pair of vagrants. Poor lodgings, eh? Good enough for swine, and that's about what we are in this place. Vagrants, they call us. Our last money paid for the trip here, so I suppose we are vagrants. I promised to work three days to pay the lodgings we'll enjoy tonight. There's a merchant next door who sells bread. Perhaps he'll let me work a day or two for a loaf of bread. I'd better go and talk to him. Uh, listen. The crowd in the marketplace at this time of night? It comes from that direction. Oh, Brother Silas, I fear we've made enemies here. Over the cleansing of that girl? We've deprived her masters of their income. And I saw that fellow who snarled at us talking to some Jews. I fancy they'll join forces against us. I think it's already happened. Listen. They're coming here. Luke and Timothy, where are they? Sightseeing, just as well. No need for all of us to get in trouble. Open up! Or we'll drag you out. Open up, you miserable vagrants. Open the door, or they'll break it down. The 
crowd came for the two apostles and dragged them to the marketplace, where Paul and Silas were flogged in public. And the Jews, fearing that the teachings of Christ would undermine the laws of Moses and Abraham, joined with the Greeks and pagans in persecuting the two apostles. And when the floggings were over, Paul and Silas were thrown unconscious into a dungeon and were chained to the floor with other prisoners. Lord Jesus, I praise thy name for our suffering. Oh, what joy it brings to know we suffer in thy name. Paul, you've come too. Thank God. We're... We're chained. Chains cannot hold us. I've not the strength to break them. Our strength is in the Lord. Even our combined strength will not break these chains. Much less batter down these dungeon walls. Silas. Silas. Have you forgotten the power of prayer? You've seen it. You have used it. You know nothing can stand against prayer if it comes from the soul. Look to the Lord, and we shall be free. They prayed, and even as they prayed, they heard a sound like that of distant thunder, and they felt the ground beneath quiver and tremble. Paul, do you hear? I hear. And I feel. And I know the Lord is answering our prayer. It's an earthquake. It is Christ freeing his servants. of the dungeon collapsed about the apostles and the chains were broken. And without harm, they walked free. The earthquake ended. But in many parts of the city, terror filled the people, for they associated the earthquake with the two apostles. And there was one who was in grievous fear the two apostles had escaped prison. And this man was the jailer, whereupon Paul went to see him. I come to forgive you. That you come at all is yet another miracle. For you escaped prison, and now you come back to surrender? Not to surrender, but to forgive. Forgive? The people cried out against me. And when they had flogged me, they put me in prison. Know you not that I am a Roman citizen? A Roman citizen? And that it is unlawful to lay hands on a citizen of Rome? And that to flog one is a crime against Rome itself? And you have committed and allowed these things to be committed. And in so doing, you have broken the law. I did not know you were a Roman citizen. Is the other one also? He is one also. Oh, then my crime is twofold. And still I tell you not to fear. You will not press against me or the magistrates? Besides the one who was with me in prison, there are others. There is one named Luke. And when we leave here, Luke will remain in this city. Will he preach? He will preach the gospel. And no one shall interfere with him. No one. I'll see to it. Not the Jews, nor the Greeks, nor the pagans. Then I have your promise. But did you cause the earthquake? Christ heard our prayers. We prayed for deliverance, and he sent deliverance. Master... If he will have me, I will turn to him. 
You talk about something you call baptism. Then baptize me in his name and all my family and my slaves and all those around me. In these days, I had not yet met Paul. But when he and Silas and the others came to Athens where I lived, then did I meet him. For I became a convert. And he and the others lodged in my house, and I could talk with him. There is nothing here for us. But the people listen. And hear nothing. I heard. But the others walked away. Still, they are intelligent, intellectual. Their culture is the culture of Athens and belongs to the dead past. Isn't it also of the present? It decays. No culture, no civilization can long endure without Christ. Even the Roman Empire decays. It cannot last. But this is not Rome. No. Nor can I squander years of my life on a people who think they are too intellectual to hear the word of Christ. But only because they try to reason. Their reason is based on pride and founded on false theories and beliefs. Whereas the culture of Jesus Christ, with all its mysteries, is eternal and founded on the one truth. That God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are one. So, you are leaving? I will do what the Lord commanded. In places where his word is rejected by all, I will shake the dust of that place from me and go elsewhere. Only I must go alone. With my bare hands, I cannot earn enough to support myself and those with me. I'll have to ask Silas and Timothy to go back. Perhaps to Jerusalem and find money. And so he left Athens, disappointed in what he found there. Yet, the seed of Christianity was planted. When he left Athens, he went on foot to Corinth, which was even more wicked than Athens. And he stood there looking at the Corinthian women who filled the houses. So here the goddess lust is worshipped. <laughs> and so is her brother, Money. Who are you, my friend? A pagan. My name is Titus. Are you of this city? A merchant. And you are opposed to money and lust? I'm aware that they exist, that they are our foremost industry. And who are you? A Jew who follows Christ. My name is Paul. <laughs> You're in poor condition. I judge the followers of Christ find small profit. Our Lord said, Blessed are the poor, for they shall inherit riches. Well, come and share my table. You look hungry. Is there a synagogue here? Well, more than one. I will go to one of these first. <laughs> Paul found many friends in Corinth and many who would listen to him. But they belonged to the lower classes, and some were slaves, and others were drenched in sin. In these days, Silas and Timothy came back with financial help. So, Silas, tell me which way you came back. By the same road we traveled together. And how did things go? Better than we dared to hope. The church is growing, even in places where they flogged us and put us in jail. Praise the Lord. And how are things going here? How long has it been since I came here? Over a year. Yes, I would say things are going well here, too. I have even converted some of the Jews. Have you been persecuted? There have been times, yes. I've been put through mud and filth and beaten. 
Still, the name of our Lord is glorified here, and I am alive. And now do we go on to Rome? No. We must finish here. And perhaps then go back to where we came from. Peter has been there. To Rome, I mean. Then we must meet him and discuss how important Rome is to the church. What is it now? The center of an empire. Silas. Do you think a place like that could long harbor the church? Or even allow the church to be founded there? It's the center of the world. Then could it become the center of the Christian world, too? We can go there. We can find out. Paul stayed in Corinth longer than in any other place. And when he came back to Antioch, he had been away over two years. But his greatest work was still ahead. This is Chesterton Radio, the true, good, and beautiful at ChestertonRadio.com. Chapter 4 on the life of St. Paul, the Apostle. My name is Julius. In my day, I was honored to serve in the Praetorian Guard in Rome. When I was assigned to overseas duty, I was commissioned a centurion and served in the Holy Land. During this period... The neighborhood of Jerusalem was disturbed by a serious outbreak of mob violence. The cause of the riot was a known troublemaker, a man named Paul, a Hebrew, a Roman citizen by birth. Since he was a Roman citizen, he was accorded the full protection of the law and taken into protective custody. Curiosity and nothing else prompted me to visit him in his jail cell. That mob would have killed you. It's not the first time I've been set upon. And so I hear. Seems to me you spend more time in jail and chained to the whipping post than you spend walking free. Body grows accustomed to floggings. Hmm. Why do you offend your fellow Jews? I offer no offense. I offer them salvation. They say you agitate against their laws. I know their laws better than most of them do. I was born a Pharisee. I was trained in their law. I was a rabbi. Now I serve Christ. I'm told you once took up arms against the Nazarene and those who followed him. I persecuted him. Now I love him. Haven't you just come back from a long journey into Asia Minor? I went as far as Macedonia. I had some idea of going on to Rome, but the Holy Spirit told me to come back here. A Holy Spirit. Well, I think you should have stayed in Macedonia. My work there is done. The man had made three long missionary trips, each one covering much the same area. I gained the impression that, together with the others, he had planted the Christian church all through Asia Minor. Macedonia and parts of Greece. A few weeks after this first meeting, I went to see him again. Are you to be my escort? No. I came to say goodbye. You're going to Caesarea. They won't let me stay here. No. The Jews here want your life. You'll be safer in another prison. 
At least prison affords my body some needed rest. Under heavy escort, he was taken away from Jerusalem and rushed to Caesarea, where he spent the best part of two years in protective custody, not as a convicted prisoner. But the Jews were not satisfied that Paul could no longer preach in public in the name of Christ. They clamored for the right to put him on trial. Roman authorities could not agree to this. Paul was a Roman citizen, and Roman law gave him the privilege of a Roman court. It was finally decided that it would be better if he were actually sent to Rome. I was given custody of this man and ordered to take him there together with other prisoners. We took one ship from Caesarea as far as Lycia in Asia Minor. There we boarded another boat which would convey us to Italy. This was a cargo ship. Despite the fact that it carried a captain, because of my position, I assumed command. Rough weather, huh? It'll get worse. Well, the captain doesn't think so. Still, I say it will. I prefer to believe the captain. And I insist we should not be at sea. We should have put into Crete. Oh, it's only another 40-mile run to Phoenix. If we get there. I have respect for the ocean. Still, I think we did best in making a run for Phoenix. There's a good harbor there. We can spend a comfortable winter. In the spring, we'll go on to Rome. You've never been there, eh? I've been planning to go there. I never expected to go there as a prisoner. But again, it's an easier way of going than by having to walk across deserts and mountains. Our Lord must have thought of that. But you doubt we'll get there. I said I doubt we'll get to Phoenix. The Lord intends I shall go to Rome. Of that I'm sure. You're strange. To be so dedicated to a man who is no different from yourself. Because he walked among men? Was he so different? You speak in the past. Christ is in the present. I speak of the Nazarene, the man who walked and talked like any other man. Except that when he was dead, he rose from the dead and walked among men once more, before going back to heaven. Well, I won't argue. I have nothing against legends. Nor will I argue against your disbelief. Of course, I've heard that there are many people living today who did think they saw the Nazarene alive after he was dead. <laughs> uh, perhaps he was a god of some sort after all. He is God. Is your kind of religion for the Jews alone? They don't seem to want it. It is for Jews... Gentiles and pagans alike. But I find more converts among the Gentiles, and not a few among the pagans. It must have some appeal if it captivated even you, a Jewish rabbi. You're a scholar, after all. Educated by the finest tutors, I'm told. My friend, intellect must recognize that God must love all the good he created. He so loved it that he manifested himself on earth to point out the way by which men could save themselves from wickedness. The intellectual mind, yes, my friend, the truly intellectual mind, does respond to the Christian doctrine. What about the simple mind? The simple mind, the simple heart, is blessed with faith that can understand Christ even better. For it asks no questions and accepts the divine mysteries of God. Ah, we must talk again. You're good company. Very good company. mysteries. I wanted to know more about them. But I did not consider this the right moment. For even as we talked, I could see the heavy blackness of a storm rolling across the waves. 
In a matter of minutes now, we knew Paul's warning had been justified. The storm broke all about us. Mountainous waves rolled over the deck. The storm increased by the hour. After three days, we were out of control and without any knowledge of our bearings. Lord, is it thy voice, Lord Jesus? Thou hast heard my voice before, Paul. Art thou the angel of the Lord? Thou knowest me, Paul. And fear not, for thou must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has spared thee and all those sailing with thee. And when all hope had been abandoned, we had given ourselves up for lost, Paul spoke to us. Fear not. I tell you to fear not and be of good cheer. There will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. What are you talking about? We shall be cast up on an island, but the ship will be lost. Island? What island? How can you know if we're near an island when even the captain of this ship has no idea where we are? An angel of the Lord God whom I serve came to me and told me. You talk like a madman. It was now the 13th day since we had sailed from Crete for Phoenix. I call this man Paul a madman. Yet he spoke with such authority that we clung to his words with some faint hope. And then we felt the sea beneath us becoming shallower. And we took soundings and found the sea no deeper than 20 fathoms and becoming even more shallow. The island which Paul had foretold was there. The wind drove us into a cove, but we could not beach our ship. We abandoned her and made our way to shore. And from the beach, we could see our ship breaking up. Once on the beach, we made fires and took stock of ourselves, soldiers, crewmen, and prisoners. They want to know how you knew about this island. An angel of the Lord God came to me. And we have no choice but to believe. Well, at least there is help here. The natives seem friendly. Barbarians, of course, but friendly enough. And we stand talking while the rest work. Come, let's put wood on the fire. A Roman officer does not toil. But put some more wood on the fire if you want to. You're not an officer. No, I'm a prisoner. Paul, look out! <laughs> A snake, a venomous reptile, slithered from under some wood and fastened its fangs into Paul's hand. We saw it, hanging there. We saw Paul shake the reptile off and drop it into the fire. I, I can save you, Paul, but you'll lose a hand quickly. Let me use my sword. Let me cut your hand off. Why? The snake was a viper. No harm will come to me. The Lord has said I must stand before Caesar. I'll not die from any snake bite on this island. Nor did he die. That we who were there could only marvel. After that, all those who were sick came to Paul. And he cured them. We stayed on the island, which was called Malta, until February, when a ship from Alexandria came in on its way to Italy. On the way, we put in at Syracuse in Sicily, and after three days, continued our journey. I was almost home now, 
and most anxious to turn Paul and the other prisoners over to the authorities in Rome. Once there, my mission was completed, and Paul was lodged in prison with some of the others, including one whose name was Luke. Well, one thing is sure, Paul, we won't see much of Rome from this dungeon. We can keep ourselves occupied until my trial comes up anyway. Yes, there are letters to write. Have you uh, kept an account of all the things that have happened to us? Oh, yes. I'll put them in documentary form one of these days soon. <laughs> the Acts of the Apostles, huh? It should make good reading. I wonder how long they'll keep us here before they try me. Not too long, I imagine. I did not attend Paul's first trial, but I heard he had been tried and found not guilty of the charges brought against him. Once free, Paul planned his next steps. You seem upset, Paul. No, puzzled. You should feel delighted. I am in Rome. I've stood trial and have been set free. Doesn't all this strike you as odd? Why should it? Because I have not come before Caesar. Oh. And how else should I stand before him except at my trial? Well, I... The answer is simple. I must stand trial again. But before that happens, I would like to go back to Troas and the other places to see how the church is doing. And I would like to go to Spain... There must be a lot of work to be done there. There were other good and sound reasons for Paul to leave Rome. The Jewish community there, angered because he had been released, would certainly plot against him. And the term troublemaker would continue to haunt this man, which would do nothing to make him popular with the Romans who wanted only peace and order in Rome. And so, for a time, Paul vanished. A few years later, I saw him again. He was back in Rome and once more in prison. I called you a madman once, and I was wrong. But I'm right in calling you a fool now. It could be. What happened and where? In a place called Troas. There was trouble there, and I had to leave. I'm charged with inciting violence. Mm. And I would judge you guilty. Most likely you foretell the verdict of the court. Why do you persist in angering the Jews? You break every known law they have. You, a Jew. So long as I abide as best I can with the law of God, I have nothing to fear. And this fellow here, he's here with you again. Luke, you remember him? Uh, I remember he was on the boat with us. Are you under arrest, too? Not at the moment. They allow me to visit Paul. Well, you must both enjoy living in dungeons. I'll take my leave. I can't stand the smell of this place. I wish you both luck. Why do we anger the Jews? And we do, don't we? Indeed we do. They're our worst enemies. Not even the pagans persecute us the way they do. And I was once a pagan. But I've never been called a renegade as you have by your people. And still I love them. I love my enemies. It's easy for me. I know. I remain a Jew, and I love the Jews, even though they want to kill me. Even though they hate me. I pity them, too. But they are my greatest failure. I've tried so hard to bring them to Christ, and I failed. Well, we have work to do, letters to write. I may not have much more time. Paul. Yes, I hear something. 
to hear anything of the outside world inside these walls. It must be a fire. I can smell smoke. Fire. Yes, it must be. The city of Rome was burning. The slums, the Jewish ghetto, and the squalid settlements all about the river were a blazing inferno. Some said Nero himself had ordered the fire. He wanted Rome destroyed so that he could build a more beautiful capital in its place. How true this was, I have no way of knowing. But thousands were burned alive, and the fire lasted many days. When it was all over, the mobs overran the ruins, crying out for Nero's death. And we of the palace guard were given our instructions to turn the anger of the people away from Nero. People of Rome, hear the truth. Hear the truth about the fire. It was the Christians. The Christians have burned Rome in their hatred of us. But Caesar promises you vengeance. I'm still here, my friend. Paul, do you know of a man called Peter? Simon Peter? He is one of us. He has been arrested, too. You will be tried together. Peter, too. I'm sorry. I'm sure you are. No, no. I mean for something else. I had to turn against you and the others. It was by Nero's order. You and all the rest are being blamed for the fire. You'll have no chance now. The people of Rome have joined the Jews against you. Nero intends you all to die. Don't feel badly, my dear friend. You cannot serve two masters. And you serve Nero. Is there a chance of our seeing Peter before the trial? I'll have him put with you. That much I can do for you. There had been previous meetings between Paul and Peter. Meetings contrived through bribery of the guards. But I was glad I could arrange for the two men to spend some time together before they both died. And Paul, just as he had foretold, came before Caesar and with Peter, faced a mock trial, which could end in only one way. In the case of Simon Peter, a Jew, the verdict is guilty, and the sentence of death shall be carried out by the Jews according to their law. In the case of Paul, a Jew born as a Roman citizen, the verdict is guilty, and the sentence of death shall be carried out by the Roman militia. In neither case can there be any appeal, and this court orders the two sentences to be carried out this day. Both men were flogged unmercifully. Then their bleeding and broken bodies were dragged away by the mob. Once outside the city, Peter was to be crucified. But Paul, a Roman citizen, was hurried away by soldiers. I chose to be one of them. It was good of you to stay with me, Julius. There will be no pain. I am too weak to feel any more pain. Forgive us. My son, what you do to me is nothing. But the forgiveness of sin lies in Christ. 
My blood cannot wash away your sins, but his can. My son, after I have gone, turn to him. Talk to Luke and the others. Listen to them. I promise. Now, do your work. No. It will not be my hand that holds the sword. Nor can I watch. Goodbye, my old friend. There is no goodbye in Christ, my son. Always remember that. There is no death. But there is everlasting life. Think well about it. They bound him naked to a block, and a soldier raised a sharp sword. A moment later, Paul's head rolled onto the ground. But in the blood of this saint, the seed of the Christian church flourished and grew. <laughs>